Friends, before I put you all to sleep, I mean, before I begin my sermon message, as you know, there is a long-standing tradition here at St. Paul where we will sing happy birthday to someone who is celebrating their 90th birthday. Now, we have someone like that today. Unfortunately, she is not here. I'm speaking about Marilyn Rumbold, who is a resident at Northgate Nursing Facility. But what Marilyn does is she watches the sermon message online. And it is the 8 o'clock service to which the message is recorded. So sometime very soon, Marilyn will get to see what we're doing right now. Hi, Marilyn. So can we please sing a happy birthday to Marilyn? See you soon, Marilyn. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A long, 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 long time ago, <laughs> in a place far, 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 far away, in other words, when I was young and imaginative, my friends and I would often play what we called the what-if game. What if we could fly? What if we could become invisible? What if we had super strength? And then we would imagine the possibilities and the outcomes. So what if we could read someone's mind. Ooh, that's either very fascinating or very scary. I don't think I would want to be around someone with that kind of superpower. We might all become like children with no filter. All the raw, unfiltered truth of our thoughts exposed before we could temper them with our usual politeness. Our hypocrisy, of which we all have to some extent, let's admit it, would be exposed. What if, by reading our minds, the full extent of our faith became known? Do we walk the walk? Is faith in Christ real and active? Or is it just a Sunday thing? Now, our gospel story today picks up with Jesus in the temple at Jerusalem. And the time is particularly interesting as this is Jesus' last trip to the temple, a yearly pilgrimage that he and his family had made throughout his entire life. But this time is different. Only a few more lessons left to teach and Jesus would be betrayed, arrested, tried, sentenced, and put to death on a cross. And here, oddly enough, with all this before him, Jesus spends part of his final days in the temple, reading the thoughts of the people's minds and the attitudes of their hearts as they made their financial contributions to the temple. Now, Jesus' observations are not lost on us today. The gospel writers found this moment worth noting. Jesus notices many rich people making fine contributions, giving from their abundance. Their donations were likely welcome and needed. 
But Jesus, probing the minds and the hearts of those giving, could tell if what they were giving was being given with love and with trust. Well, there are all kinds of givers. Cheerful givers, those who give begrudgingly, those who hold back, and those who give at personal sacrifice. And so along comes this widow who puts in such a trite amount that it would make no difference at all in the final tally. But apparently Jesus is really bad at math and finance. No, not really, just making sure you're all still with me. He says this poor widow put in more than all the others. Well, no she didn't, but yes she did. Two copper coins, about a penny. This was not merely a, a tithe, it was not an offering, but a sacrifice. Everything she had to live on. And Jesus probes her heart too. And finds her attitude better than lukewarm in faith. He sees in her an act of worship, of sacrifice, of trust that God will provide and will take care of her. The measurement of her gift was not made in the value of two copper coins or in shekels or denarii or talents or drachma or in our term, dollars and cents or euros or crypto. The measurement of her gift was faith and trust. Now, my message to you today is at a crossroads. If I had the superpower, if I could probe your mind, you're likely thinking that this message is about stewardship and I'm about to take this 2,000 year old story and tie it to our giving today. That's not happening. This isn't about shekels or denarii. It's not about dollars and cents. There's another reason for Jesus to point out the poor widow to his disciples. Now let's talk about poverty. The state of being poor. Having little or no means of support. Drained of resources. Needy. Unfortunate. Having little to offer. That may adequately describe this widow. She may have been devoid of resources, but she was rich in generosity, faith, worship, and sacrifice. She found obedience to God and the needs of others of greater value than herself. Now hold that thought. I said earlier that this was Jesus' last visit to the temple. By now, Jesus had already rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to shouts of Hosanna. This would be his final Passover. Soon, Jesus would do some giving of his own. He will preside over the Last Supper to bequeath his body and blood to the disciples and to us for all time. And then he will shed his blood for all on a cross. For the rich, for the poor, for his disciples, for the widow, for dignitaries and lowly shepherds, for the wicked and for the righteous, for you and for me. This widow, who gave all that she had to live on, 
who considered the needs of others greater than herself was a preview of Jesus, who would give all that he had, who would have the sins of the world heaped upon him, who would become even more, po more poor than her. And like her, Jesus gave in an act of love, of sacrifice, of faith and trust. Knowing that this is what his heavenly father wanted and willed for him. Jesus made himself poor. And he put the will of his heavenly father and our well-being above that of his own. Jesus didn't give what was in his pocket or his money pouch, but everything that he had. Jesus valued our salvation, our forgiveness of sins, our hope of eternity above what he had for himself, that being his own life. And willingly suffered, willingly experienced the Father turning his back on his Son. Total separation from God in a moment of judgment so that you and I would never have to know abandonment from God. Jesus, to use the description Paul wrote to the Philippians, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The cheerful, faithful, obedient, sacrificial giver does not ask, what's in it for me? But willingly does God's will and makes himself to be the servant of all. So, must we now suffer for our faith? Denying ourselves and everything to be like Jesus? No. Even our most righteous, selfless acts do not merit brownie points or earn our salvation. No, Jesus took care of that. We are motivated by this lesson to not earn our salvation, but to respond to the salvation, the grace, and the forgiveness of God that we already have. And we cannot respond. We cannot have faith. We cannot have trust. We cannot make sacrifice. We cannot respond in love and worship until we know the object of our affection and appreciate just how much He did for us by giving all that He had, His very life, for us. The widow... She becomes an example, a sign pointing us to the Savior, helping us understand what giving all he had truly means, what shedding his lifeblood for us truly means, what taking our shame and enduring it all and ensuring that our reconciliation with God, what it truly cost our Lord. When we offer ourselves to others, we can't do it out of duty, fear, or even respect. We do it as a daily offering of gratitude for what Christ gave for us. Friends, don't let 2,000 years lessen in your minds the cost of the sacrifice, what it means or your heart attitude toward it. Think of it as if Christ just died for you yesterday. We learn from this to love our Lord with all our heart, all our mind, with all of our strength, and like the widow, 
with all that we have and all we are. Christ gave more than this for you and for me. He gave his life in the most shameful yet most glorious way to show his love and God's desire that we would be together for eternity. Two copper coins. But who's counting? Amen.